a stolen corpse, a Viking funeral pyre, and seeing your own face on your friend's casket are just a few strange things that have happened at rock musicians' funerals. Motorhead's Lemmy was born Ian Fraser Kilmester on December 24, 1945. He came of age during the British invasion of the 1960s and got his start playing with various local bands in England. While Lemmy achieved some success with the psychedelic prog rock band Hawkwind in the early 1970s, it was when he left to play bass and sing as the founder of Motorhead that he became a legend of rock and roll. The band found the most success in the early 1980s, due in part to their signature song, Ace of Spades. But even through numerous lineup changes, Lemmy's fan base never dwindled until his death from cancer on December 28, 2015. Lemmy was not a somber person, and his funeral featured a long list of rock stars who appeared to pay their respects to the fallen frontman. Attendees included Dave Grohl of Foo Fighters, Slash of Guns N' Roses, Robert Trujillo and Lars Ulrich of Metallica, Rob Helford of Judas Priest, and Scott Ian of Anthrax. After various heartfelt speeches, the service was capped off with Lemmy's bass being plugged into a wall of amplifiers, filling the chapel with blaring feedback. Dave Brockie may not be a terribly well-known name in the heavy metal community, but that's because his public persona was that of Odorous Urungus, the lead vocalist of Gwar. The band came together in 1984, focusing on over-the-top attire and slime and blood-filled live performances. Gwar's shock rock shenanigans were a large part of their appeal. The band concocted an elaborate backstory about its members being exiled from another planet and determined to rule Earth. They managed to garner some mainstream recognition with Grammy Award nominations in 1993 and 1996. As the face of the band, Brocky made numerous appearances on TV, including the Fox News show Red Eye with Greg Gutfeld as an intergalactic correspondent. What was, where does Guar stand on those who illegally download Guar songs? Because you're not, it's on taking- their necks until their heads explode. Brocky passed away on March 23, 2014, at the age of 50, from a heroin overdose. Brocky was cremated, but his alien persona was given a Viking funeral. Brocky's odorous Urungus costume was placed into a boat with various gifts, pushed out into a lake, and burned, as per Viking tradition, with a flaming arrow shot by friend Ed Harrington starting the funeral pyre. Iconic female rock singer Janis Joplin already displayed a talent for singing when she was a child. Joplin struggled to commit to her college studies with any consistency, but her love of performing remained consistent. Eventually, she got her big break as the front woman for the San Francisco-based rock band Big Brother and the Holding Company, which achieved massive popularity following their appearance at the 1967 Monterey Pop Festival. But tensions within the band caused Joplin to split up from them and establish herself as a solo artist, notably performing at Woodstock in 1969. Joplin passed away on October 4, 1970 from a drug overdose, when she was only 27 years old. She stipulated in her will that $2,500 be set aside for her friends to have one last bash in her honor. In Pearl the Obsessions and Passions of Janis Joplin by Ellis Amburn, Joplin's guitarist James Gurley recalls of the party, everybody just got as drunk and as f***ed up as they could. I think it was fitting to send her off that way. I made a toast. Here's to what's her name? There was no talking about her at all. Graham Parsons' impact on music is immense, even if you've never heard of him. Born in 1946, it seems that Parsons was destined for a life of music. Even when he was enrolled at Harvard, Parsons frequently shunned his studies in favor of jamming with his friends. Parsons dropped out of college and ended up in the International Submarine Band, where he pioneered the country rock fusion that would become his trademark. Following his time with them, Parsons joined the Flying Burrito Brothers, further developing his unique genre bending. The last few years of Parsons' life was affected by substance abuse abuse, which ruined his marriage and his creative output, and led to his tragic death on September 19, 1973. The singer and songwriter wasn't given a traditional funeral. His friend Michael Martin and road manager Phil Kaufman intercepted his body before it was shipped to New Orleans from California, took it out to the Joshua Tree Desert and burned it, just as Parsons wanted. Kaufman claims that a dust devil emerged from the late musician's coffin during its immolation, scattering his ashes across his favorite place on Earth. Harry Nielsen is generally recognized as one of the most talented singer-songwriters in rock history, having won two Grammy Awards and earning the respect and friendship of the Beatles. He developed his musical talents as a young man working at the Paramount Theater in Los Angeles. The constant exposure to some of the most popular artists at the time inspired him to try writing music himself. All of his efforts culminated in the release of his first album, 1967's Pandemonium Shadow Show. For the rest of his career, Nielsen garnered considerable acclaim for his unique songwriting style. 
and cultivated a legion of fans, despite rarely ever performing live. Nielsen passed away on January 15, 1994, after years of congenital heart problems. His funeral took place two days later, the exact day when the San Fernando Valley was hit by a deadly 6.7 magnitude earthquake. The disaster added another pall over the funeral, which was attended by music titans like George Harrison, Jeff Lynne, and Mickey Dolenz. The earthquake overshadowed what should have been a celebratory gathering of a legendary musician. As stated in Rolling Stone, musician and friend Jimmy Webb said, there was no fuss over the fact that he was gone because the Northridge quake flattened about half of Southern California. It was not a slow news day when he passed over. Ronnie Van Zant lived a rough early life, but music was his life preserver. His first influences were country singer Merle Haggard, the rock bands The Rolling Stones and Free, which he'd later combine into his pioneering brand of Southern rock. He formed Leonard Skinner in the 60s with other like-minded musicians, recording their first demo in 1970. It didn't lead to much at first, but the band forged their sound releasing their debut album pronounced Leonard Skinner in 1973, which went certified gold by the end of 1974. The band experienced a major tragedy on October 20, 1977, when their plane crashed around Gillsburg, Mississippi, killing several members, including Van Zant. Musician Charlie Daniels was one of Van Zant's closest pals, and the influential Southern rocker did something special for the service of his fallen friend. Daniels recalled in Leonard Skinner, remembering the free birds of Southern rock. It wasn't long before people started calling me for comments. Sitting in a hotel room, possibly in Phoenix, I wrote a poem. At the funeral, I read it and sang Peace in the Valley and gave it to Judy Seymour, Ronnie's widow. The son of country musician Jerry Abbott, it's unsurprising that Daryl Lance Abbott picked music as his calling, but being more inspired by the hard rock bands of the 1970s and early 80s, the man known as Dimebag Daryl pursued a more aggressive sound. He picked up the guitar, while his brother Vinnie Paul picked up the drums, and together formed Pantera, one of the most popular heavy metal bands of the 1990s. While the band enjoyed considerable success into the early 2000s, it seemed that Pantera's time was over when the band members went their separate ways to work on their side projects. Daryl and Vinnie Paul started their own metal band, Damage Plan, which released their first and only album, New Found Power, in 2004. Damage Plan wasn't able to capitalize on their initial success. Four people were shot and killed inside the Al Rosa Villa Lounge. It was the second worst mass shooting in Columbus history. Daryl was shot and killed while playing a concert at the El Rosa Villa in Columbus, Ohio on December 8, 2004. A service was held to commemorate the heavy metal guitar legend at the Arlington Convention Center in Texas, which was attended by a long list of rock stars that included Zach Wilde, Jerry Cantrell, and legendary guitarist Eddie Van Halen. Van Halen gave a speech and shared a touchingly profane voicemail the late guitarist left for him with the attendees. Like his brother Dimebag Daryl, Vinnie Paul pursued a harder-edged sound in contrast to the western twang of his country musician father. It was Kiss's legendary 1975 album Alive that inspired him to become a drummer and join his brother in forming Pantera. After the heartbreaking death of his brother, he went on to perform with the heavy metal supergroup Hell Yeah. Like his brother, Vinnie Paul was taken too soon passing away due to heart problems on June 22, 2018, when he was only 54 years old at his home in Las Vegas, Nevada. He was buried in his hometown of Arlington, Texas alongside his brother. Paul was buried in a Kiss casket that was paid for by Kiss's own Gene Simmons and Paul Stanley. Ex-Kiss guitarist Ace Frehley wasn't as comfortable about it. He appeared on the Cassius Moore show saying, I had to make a little speech outside at the cemetery, and it was weird knowing Vinny was inside this box and my face was on it. There's nothing illegal about being buried in a Kiss car. Coffin, is there? No, absolutely not. It's a legal coffin. God will open it, the pearly gates much faster. It, I it Bob Marley spent much of his early life in Jamaica's Trench Town, which is where he first became interested in music. Despite the neighborhood's poor living conditions, it developed a reputation as a hub for talented musicians, and the young Marley followed suit. He started his own band, The Wailers, which attracted a devoted following with their first hit, 1963's Simmer Down. The band really leapt to stardom after they signed with Island Records in 1972, leading to the release of the album Catch a Fire the following year. Bob Marley and The Wailers left Jamaica to the world, opening for artists like Bruce Springsteen and Sly and the Family Stone. Marley and its band experienced growing popularity around the globe throughout the 1970s, but their success was cut short when he died from cancer on May 11, 1981. Marley was more than the singer and guitarist of a pioneering reggae band. He was a cultural and political icon, so he was given a suitably grand send-off. Nearly 100,000 fans and followers filed into the arena where his body was displayed to get one last look at the legendary musician, who was buried with his 
Ganja's guitar, a Bible, and a stalk of ganja. The highlight of the service was the performances by his backup singers, the I-3s, and his backup band, the Wailers. Before Jimi Hendrix became the legend that he is today, he was born Johnny Allen Hendrix on November 27, 1942. Early on, he was touched by the sounds of B.B. King, Muddy Waters, Buddy Holly, and other rock and blues musicians, so he picked up the guitar himself and never looked back. He spent time as a session musician before starting his own band, The Jimi Hendrix Experience, and released a string of hits like Purple Haze and Foxy Lady. One of his most iconic live performances was at Woodstock, which included his famous rendition of the Star Spangled Banner. But after barely three years in the limelight, Jimi Hendrix passed away on September 18, 1970. The funeral was attended by his closest music collaborators, including band members Mitch Mitchell, Noel Redding, Buddy Miles, and Eddie Kramer. Much of his family was present, and even his imprisoned brother Leon Hendrix made it to the service, only possible because of the permission granted by the jail he was incarcerated in at the time. The most heartwarming part of Hendrix's funeral was the recitation of his song Angel by Freddie Mae Gautier, a family friend and noted civil rights activist.